Welcome. Is everyone hearing me? Okay. St. Louis is in the house. Thanks for being here for the next three hours. We're here to show you, uh, give you a taste of everything from our beer um, to some of our favorite foods and to share with you some of the amazing work being done in St. Louis where AI is being applied to take on some of the, the world's biggest challenges. So thank you for being here. We want to get started right away with our amazing panelists, but please enjoy, drink the beer, eat the food. We've got t-shirts to give away with the iconic St. Louis flag. So thanks for being here and we will get started by introducing our AI gateway panel. Come on up. I'm gonna hand the mic off to Nadine Alame, who is the executive director of the Taylor Geospatial Institute in St. Louis. Thank you, Tracy. How are you guys? Woo! All right, who is here from St. Louis? Woo! All right, they're over there. <laughs> That's great. So I'm very happy to be here. You guys come on in, please. Uh, I'm Nadine Alamy. I'm the executive director of the Taylor Geospatial Institute. So a show of hands, who has heard of the Taylor Geospatial Institute? Ooh, I like this. Cool. So if you have not heard about the Taylor Geospatial Institute, you're not crazy because we are very, very new. It's actually the largest philanthropic investment in research for geospatial in St. Louis. So, I have another question for you. You're gonna have to talk to me. Yes, that's the deal. Who has, or who knows what geospatial is? Two people, three people, four people, five, six, all right. Uh, so we're going to leave here everybody knowing about geospatial. You know why? Because you already know about geospatial. Did you use Uber to get here? Anybody? Yes? Did you check the weather to know what you're going to wear today? That's geospatial information. <laughs> Have you watched the news about either some disaster, some flood, some hurricane? some war somewhere, that's all geospatial. Do you know about drones? Autonomous cars? Yes? Geospatial, geospatial, geospatial. We're all about location. I think for me, uh, it's all about where is the nearest Starbucks everywhere I go. <laughs> so that's geospatial to you. I'm very excited to be here with you today because we're gonna talk about AI. All right, show of hands, AI. Come on, guys. Who has used ChatGPT? <laughs> Other than my kids. <laughs> Great. So we have an amazing panel for you today on AI from St. Louis to the world. And the reason it's amazing, it's one, we have three amazing gentlemen, but my favorite part is that it's in three different domains. We're gonna talk about AI in health, we're gonna talk about in AI in agriculture, we're gonna talk about AI in national security. Another question, ready? Who eats food? Hey! Who eats food? <laughs> All right, do you want more nutritious food? Yes. Uh, do you want sustainable agriculture as we produce this nutritious food? Yes. So you definitely, definitely need to hear what Jason has to say because that's exactly what they do at his company, Benson Hill. So Jason is the chief technology officer at Benson Hill. Food. I have another question for you. Ready? Who has an Apple Watch, a Garmin, anything that tracks your steps? Yes, in the back. Yes, all the way from the bar. 
You track your steps, your heart rate. Uh, guess what? And I'm learning a lot here because what Shen Yang does is actually he can even predict your mental health using your wearables. So AI in health, he's going to tell you all about it. He is the director of AI for the Health Institute at WashU. Any WashU alums here? Because I know you were here yesterday. <laughs> That's great. And last but not least, do you watch the news? Yes. So you're aware of the war in Ukraine? Uh, you're aware of the situation in Gaza? Do you see in the newspapers or on TV all these maps of troops, of resources, of just situation? Q, Mark Munsell, uh, from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. So they keep us safe uh, by actually collecting information around geospatial from all over the world and analyzing it and figuring out, not just for wars, but for humanitarian purposes, disaster response. Mark is the director at NGA, so the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. He's the director of Data and Digital Innovation Directorate. And the chief of AI? Yes, the chief of AI. So, are you as excited as I am to have these amazing people? Yes, all right, that's great. That's really great. So I want to start with the simplest, simplest question. Maybe I'll start with you, Mark. So what do you really, really do? And why are you on an AI panel? First of all, I want to make sure that this is working. Is this working? Okay, good. <clears throat> I will speak louder. Um, so the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency is not the world's most known intelligence agency, but we are a three-letter agency. And I think Nadine's description was good. Um, we do try to provide advantage for our country by providing warning, providing information on our adversaries. For example, uh, when Russia was beginning to mount their forces on the Ukrainian border, NGA's roles and responsibility was to give the world warning that that was happening. Another good example, uh, SEAL Team 6 raided the Bin Laden compound. We gave SEAL Team 6 so much detail, so many details about that compound, they knew exactly where every step, where every stair, where every wall, where every floor in that compound was. So this is what our agency does. Um, we typically use either satellite imagery or uh, some form of remote sensing. And now we're using artificial intelligence to determine this information automatically as much as we possibly can to provide that warning, to provide our president and our combatant commanders the greatest advantage that we can provide to our country. Thank you, Mark, and it's really an honor to have you here with us. Thank you so much. Jason, what do you really do? And where does AI fit? I've been into your website and seen like from the sea to the plant, to the food, to our health. What do you do? I get to work on really interesting problems. And the really interesting problem I'm working on is how do you feed a growing population, a growing population that needs more and more protein? Soybean is the crop that is the king of protein. It's grown on 80 million acres across the Midwest. 75% of it is used for food and feed. It literally um, feeds most of us here in terms of animal protein that, that it's used. Interestingly, it's not designed for that purpose. It's designed for yield. And when you think about it, its yield is, its protein has actually been going down over the years. So at Benson Hill, we took a new look at it and said, well, let's design this crop for its actual purpose that it's being used for. Let's design a crop for feed and food. It's an, it's, a, it's an easy thing to say. It's a pretty complicated thing to do. And that's where machine learning and AI comes in because now you have to relook at the genome of the crop, you have to look at how it's being produced, 
and you have to reinvent it from a breeding viewpoint. It's exciting because we're doing it and we're actually making a ton of progress, which I'll talk about later, but um, that's what I do. Fantastic. So, Chen Yang, please tell me what can you get out of my watch <laughs> and how can I use it better? Sure. Um, I'll give you two examples of the AI for Health Institute's research in this area. So the first, right, we all know depression is a worldwide problem. According to WHO, over 280 million people have depression, and over 50% of them are not diagnosed or treated. The reason it is so difficult to detect depression uh, is because you know, there's not enough psychiatrists and it's a lot of effort to get it diagnosed. So we figured, right, if you could detect depression right, using just your wearable wristbands, right? So we did this research where we took 9,000 people's Fitbit data, right, along with their depression and anxiety disorder diagnosis, we built deep learning models so that you can detect depression unobtrusively just based on your Fitbit wristband data. That's great. Uh, all right, audience, is this cool or what? It is cool. So I have a question. Uh, because we're talking here about AI, and uh, I don't want to date myself, but when I went to school, there wasn't AI, right? And we sort of stumbled upon AI in the geospatial field. We used to literally get a satellite imagery and digitize the roads ourselves and the roundabouts and the cars. And now you train, right? That's the machine learning part. You train a model and voila, you can get the roundabouts, the roads, the infrastructure, the parking lots, I mean, you name it. So. Uh, and that's how I came across AI. So I'm very curious, what, you know, where did this AI pop in in your work? And sort of like when, where are we on this journey? Who wants to take the first shot? Yeah, I, can, I can start off. So I wasn't trained in AI. It didn't exist when I was going through university. I was trained in statistics and quantitative genetics and in the sciences, which in some respects is actually difficult to come from there to AI because in AI, you're really framing up interesting questions and you don't know why you're getting the answers. And in science, you always, you pretty much always want to know why. Um, so that's a shift. And it's kind, of a, it's kind of a constant, I think, in our world that um, what you do in your career really shifts. It changes a lot. Um, yeah, so our, we have more information, we need the why, and we need the AI to help us in the process. Yeah, so what we, what we looked at was, um, you know, we started with, you know, I'll give you a really good example. So we, work, we worked on um, looking at how things get advanced in our pipelines. And in the, in the sciences, you know, we're always advancing things through discovery, through pre-production, and eventually to commercial. It's expensive and it takes a long time and a lot of information is generated. And we simply said, well, can we start to predict in our pipeline what's going to move ahead um, really before anyone knows it? And what we found was, and this is interesting because it was the first time we'd done this, we could do it about on average as well as the experts when we first started. And you know, so I talked to some of my colleagues and they said, well, you don't know why and it's only as good as the average. Is this really that interesting? And I said, well, I know who all these experts are and I'm beating 50% of them and it's completely scalable and repeatable. Um, I think we've got something here that's pretty interesting. And, you know, pretty quickly after that, it got better and better. But um, it's a different way of thinking um, that really takes on. I see Mark nodding his head. <laughs> yeah, so for, for us, we use um, technology called computer vision, right? Which is a, uh, isn't necessarily AI, but when you use machine learning like in the domain of computer vision, um, that, that's mostly what we're doing. I think, it, I think people are familiar with computer vision. You're, you're probably familiar with it, maybe you're not familiar with the term. Uh, when you go and use Google Lens or when you um, have Google help you identify uh, a, a cat on an image, 
Google gets that right like 99.999% of the time. You take a picture of a cat, Google knows it's a cat. Where it gets a little more difficult for Google is the sort of details down the ontology, uh, different breeds of cat or variations of cats, is where maybe Google isn't as good because the model hasn't been trained on the details. So this problem set, or this technology is something that we use, but it's much more difficult to detect a cat from low Earth orbit, right? So when you have an image and the cat is only a few pixels on the image, these models are much more sophisticated. And so for us, when we're trying to uh, detect military objects of interest, uh, for example, a Houthi missile launcher, um, this is something that's important to us right now, as these missile launchers, are, missile launchers, launchers are attacking ships in the Red Sea. Um, we have to train these models, these computer vision models, on these specific instances of missile launchers in these specific biomes of the Yemen desert. Um, and so, this is something that takes a lot of humans to get started. It takes humans to say recognize what this, that have the expertise to recognize what this missile launcher is, recognize it in context, train the model to be able to detect these. It takes humans then again to sort of test and evaluate the model. Then it takes good humans to do something with the results of that model. Like in this case, notify the Office of Naval Intelligence and say, your ships are under threat in the, in the Red Sea. That's a, I think that's a the best example of how we're using artificial intelligence today. That's, that's fascinating. Can you top that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, not sure I can, I'll try. Um, so AI for healthcare really happened about a decade ago when two brilliant things happened at the same time. One was the advancement in AI algorithms, the revolution in deep learning, Right, when I did my PhD, right, AI was in its winter. Like, nobody was talking about AI. AI. People don't believe AI can do anything. There was this joke in computer science where it says, oh, in computer science, there's two kinds of uh, you know, researchers, faculty. There's systems people, there's theory people. They look down at each other. Both of them look down at AI people. Okay, so that's what happens when I did my PhD about 20 years ago. But 10 years ago, AI had this breakthrough in deep learning. And then, also equally important, if not more, we have a lot more data in healthcare, right? So there's the electronic health records where almost all major hospitals are using electronic health records with all these digitalized data. Then there's also these wearable data we just talked about. We're getting 500, 000, uh, 500 million people bought wearables in one year, for example. We actually have a lot of data coming in. I'll give you another example where, so what happens is a combination of AI and data in healthcare opens up entirely new pathways to solve really challenging problems where people got stuck on, right? For example, there's a surgeon who came to me and said, you know, in pancreatic cancer, right, we have this problem where surgery is the only cure, but at the same time, pancreatic surgery is extremely risky. It has a 40% complication rate. Every time with a patient, right, the surgeon, the patient has a challenging decision is whether this patient should go for it, go for the surgery, right? He said it would be really nice if we could predict the risk level of a patient right, developing complications after the surgery. So that's what we did, right? So basically we give the, uh, the patient a Fitbit device Right, one month before surgery, we look at that data, and then we build machine learning models to predict right, the risk level of this patient, right, so that we can inform that decision about whether to take surgery, and also to enroll in prehabilitation programs if they are not ready for it. Aren't we lucky that we have this at, at, you know, at our disposal? It's amazing, I really think it's amazing. So, um, we would like to take questions from the audience, yes? Yeah? So start to think about what you'd like to ask these amazing people. I kid you not, we do panels all over the world. I've never seen the AI leaders in health and food and national security on one stage just willing to talk to people. So definitely start thinking about your questions. 
I have a question here, um, and thank you, Greater St. Louis Inc., for getting us together. St. Louis, right? So why St. Louis? And I can, I'll, I'll start because this is a weird journey. You can tell probably from my accent. So I'm Lebanese, right? Came to the U.S., went to MIT, worked at NASA, did this whole geospatial thing, and now I'm leading this institute in St. Louis, and you wonder, huh, how did this happen? What's in St. Louis that is attracting these geospatial people? It's because we're trying to make geospatial, right, the home of geospatial in St. Louis. We're trying to get geospatial from St. Louis to the whole, whole world. Thank you again to NGA, and I'll let Mark, I'm not gonna steal your thunder, but for me, St. Louis, the home of geospatial, that's why I want to be there, right? And so I'm wondering because, you know, I also, I love hearing where people came from and how they got here. So I detected an accent from Jason, for example. <laughs> so why St. Louis? Why you in St. Louis? Why Benson Hill in St. Louis? And why AI in food in St. Louis? Four questions in one. That's complicated. Um, yeah, I'm not from St. Louis. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in Australia. Um, and, you know, partway through my career, I was working in Australia. We'd, we'd just had a son. He was born with um, Down syndrome. And I had uh, a work experience in, um, in America. And came to the U.S. We worked for about six months. And... I just found my son was getting much better care than we could possibly get in, in, um, in Australia. And the work opportunities were, were much better. So we decided to, to emigrate. Um, he's doing fabulously. He's got um, powerlifting records in, um, in Missouri, state records. Um, he's just under 30 years old. He's doing fantastic. Um, awesome. But you know, as a concerned parent, you, that's always something you take into account. Um, for me, coming to the U.S. just made, made a ton of sense and coming to St. Louis made a ton of sense because there's more plant scientists with PhDs in St. Louis than anywhere else in the world. And when you think about innovating in agriculture, it kind of takes about three things. It takes really brilliant plant scientists, it takes really brilliant people with a data background, and really brilliant people in AI and statistics. And when, when I look at my organization, that's literally how it's made up, is we pair those three things together to drive innovation. And St. Louis is, you know, just a hub for innovation in, in the work I'm doing around plant sciences. Did I get all four? You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Chen Yang, same, same question. Yep. So I was not from St. Louis either, uh, but I have been in St. Louis over 21 years. So it's actually the longest city, uh, the city I've spent the longest of my time so far. Um, it turns out St. Louis is a great place to do AI for healthcare. Um, first of all, St. Louis has multiple sort of great healthcare systems, um, great you know, leading medical schools such as the Washington University School of Medicine. Do you know actually what you received? Uh, the second most NIH research funding among all medical schools in the country. Um, so, but more importantly, right, so there's a, this great culture at WashU and, uh, and other places in St. Louis to collaborate, right, to collaborate across boundaries. Um, I'll give you one real example, right? So about 10 years ago, I gave this talk at a conference about how we used wireless sensor networks to monitor patients in the hospital. Right, so, so after my talk, one of, the, one of the colleagues from one of the leading medical uh, schools in the East Coast actually stood up and said, oh, this is really great to see. I was working on the exactly the same thing for seven years on the East Coast. I couldn't get into a single hospital there, but Barnes Jewish Hospital and that's a thing, and you know, we were able to do this world leading research because of that collaborative culture across engineering and medicine. I think it's fantastic. So I know I was listening to the previous panel, I think it was about Wisconsin, and they were saying how humble they are. I think, 
you know, St. Louis people are even more humble and we need to get over it. So <laughs> it shouldn't be the best kept secret. We should get it out there. Mark? Nadine, Nadine, what about my accent? No, absolutely. <laughs> Please tell me. I have me. a St. Louis accent. So we say things like washer, washer. Did you put your clothes in the washer? We call the, the Interstate 44, we call it Farty, farty Far. What, what else? What else? Uh, what? Yep. Yeah, so what about my accent? Come on. I can't stop laughing I was now. <laughs> I was born in St. Louis, and, um, and I think, yeah, the, back to the Wisconsin panel, really fascinating to see a lot of that panel, um, really intrigued by the Midwest Games uh, CEO. They, they went out, they went out, you know, in a lot of cases had to go to Silicon Valley or go to uh, California or the East Coast. Um, St. Louis has a lot of famous tech entrepreneurs that have, that have done that. We have Jack Dorsey, we have Jim McKelvey, we have Sam Altman. So talking about AI, right? Sam Altman is from St. Louis. So um, it's, I think it's really important that uh, the tenet that the last panel had, which is we have creative, brilliant people in the Midwest. We just have to figure out a way to sort of keep them here and, and have them flourish in place instead of have to go out to uh, California or Texas. Do you want to tell us about the NGA decision uh, in St. Louis? So, so Nadine was mentioning that the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency did have, we have two headquarters, we have one in, in Washington, D.C., Springfield, Virginia, and we have one in St. Louis, and we have about 3,500 employees in St. Louis, and that's it's one of the area's uh, largest employers definitely the largest federal employer, but there was a time where we were making a decision whether we should leave St. Louis and either go to Illinois or go somewhere else, and we made the decision to stay in St. Louis, and we made the decision to build our new West headquarters, we call it, in North St. Louis, in an area that has traditionally been, um, you know, has been uh, under blight. And so making that decision, making the federal investment to build our new headquarters there, did provide some energy, it provided some motivation for the city, it provided motivation for the bi-state area to partner with us and invest in this technology. And it is, it's difficult to explain the technology when we talk about geospatial, because it's a combination of space, it's a combination of remote sensing, it's a combination of uh, industry called geographic information systems. It brings all these sort of businesses together into one. But when we made that announcement, it was a real sort of key uh, event for the community to rally behind what we did for us to partner with them and for that federal investment to come into North St. Louis. Thank you. It's an amazing story and the energy that it's generating in St. Louis is very, very amazing. So uh, I hope you guys are, you know, thinking about a couple of uh, good questions. Tough questions would be great. Fun questions. I love the people like in the, on the bar out there getting ready. Uh, let, me, uh, let me ask one more because life is not all, this is amazing, this is great, we've got it figured out, you know, everything is rosy. There, it's tough and you must be facing some serious challenges, um, especially around AI, whether it's a lot of information, whether you can't find the right people, whether uh, nobody trusts your results, uh, whether you're trying to insert AI in a system that's not designed for AI. I mean, I can think of so many challenges. So let's get real. Maybe we can start with health. What All are right. the challenges here? Okay, sure. AI actually faces a lot of challenges in healthcare because you are dealing with human health, right? So certainly the whole trustworthiness of AI is critical. It's Right, so AI will not replace doctors in the near future because of that reason. So it's going to be a more a collaborative relationship, right? So um, then it raises all kinds of questions. For example, we don't like AI to be a black box when it has to do with a patient's health. If you make a certain prediction, you have to be able to, be able to explain it. Right? You have to point to actionable risk factors that are modifiable with medicine because if you say this person is high risk, 
because they are too old, right? So that's not a modifiable factor, right? So what I have, have to point out are actionable advice, right, to the doctors. And then, the, then you have to figure out how the doctors and the AI work with each other, right? So how do they complement each other? How do they trust each other? Uh, so that the combination of the two become the better doctor, right? So as is often said, Right, so AI will not replace doctors, but doctors who use AI will replace those who don't. So basically, we are trying to make that a reality. No, well, well said. And you could see people nodding their heads about uh, doctors using AI are better than the doctors who don't use the AI. Gotcha. What are the tough issues in agriculture and food? Not to depress us. I mean, I'm, I'm tracking my stuff here. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, there's a few things that are always kind of perennial. One is you're always, you're always kind of delayed in getting to answers by moving data around, new forms of data. I think that, to me, that's kind of cost of goods. It comes with the territory. If you're innovating, you're bringing diverse data sets together, that's life. If that's become really easy, you're probably not innovating. Um, Talent, talent's always one. I kind of take a simplifying viewpoint here that whatever someone comes with is not ultimately what we want. We're always going to want people to move to the middle. If you come from a data science background, we're going to want you to understand plain sciences because you're just more effective when you move to the middle. So that kind of simplifies that, that side of things as well. Um, you know, the... I was leaving my train of thought. What's hard? I mean, it's because you have a lot of hard problems to solve. So yeah. that was like a talent issue and how you bring people in the middle. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the hard thing, the thing that I have spend the most energy on is coming up with new questions. Coming up with questions that you can solve through AI and constructing them in a way that a machine can do it and a machine can learn. Um, I still think that's kind of a, a, it's a place where we're not bad at it, but I think we can just be a lot better at it. So that's where I put a lot of energy into it. No, I feel you, definitely. Mark, what's hard about your job? Yeah, I, for us, it's really scale. So our agency is one of the world's largest consumer of cloud storage and cloud compute. Um, we image... Uh, a lot of the earth every, every day. And so you can imagine it's, uh, it's petabytes and petabytes of information. So to not just the quality of the algorithms, not just the quality of the models that we struggle with, um, it's sometimes that we're trying to build computer vision models of rarely observed objects. Objects that might only be in the open for minutes or, or hours at a time. And so it's, your training data is very limited because of that. And then the cost, the cost of storing that data, running inference uh, on all that imagery, uh, and to do it at scale so that we can provide warning as fast as we can, um, it's, it's, it's very costly. It's very expensive. So if we have any folks from Congress here, uh, you'd like to talk to me afterwards, that would be, I'd be happy to talk to you. I love this, never missing an opportunity. <laughs> so, uh, any questions from the audience? I mean, I have a whole two-pager here, but this is for you. Any questions? Yes, please. Hey, y'all. Hey. I'm from St. Louis. I live down in South City and down in Dutchtown. Yeah. Um, so, I would love to know, from your perspective, where you see your three industries or areas of expertise Piece intersecting in St. Louis. So there's there's obviously the development individually, but I think some of the greatest things come from mi the mixing of tech and the mixing of industries. So I'd just love to hear where are you seeing your own industry mixing between yourselves and between others in St. Louis? Can I start even though I'm the moderator? <laughs> sure. Please. <laughs> they gave me a mic, so <laughs> uh, so to me, uh, 
That's why I'm excited about geospatial in St. Louis, because what is geospatial? We have geospatial in health because you can track, you know, how the disease is spreading. We've all experienced COVID and we got all the maps everywhere in every newspaper. Uh, it's all over agriculture. What do you plant? Where? When? Is also and I'm using the satellite imagery and the drone imagery. So all of a sudden, uh, transportation, infrastructure, everything to us. And that's where, you know, if you're looking for one type of skill, there, it's not one type of skill. We need everybody. You need the computer scientists, the software developers, but also the urban planners and the transportation people and the plant science people and the doctors. So to me, it's just like this, we need this, um, every, you know, geospatial can bring all of these towards these use cases that end up being in these domains. But again, it's not about me. So please, guys. Yeah, I can, uh, obviously national security intersects both of these things. Um, I'll, just, I'll just generalize it as health. Uh, to be able to track uh, disease, to be able to track potentially lethal disease, let's say Ebola in Africa, that's a great example. Um, you know, it's a national security issue. And so the way that it spreads spatially and, and over spatial and temporarily over time, and as much information as we can collect on that to be able to provide um, information back to the government so they can act on it, so they can mobilize and they can, uh, and, and the same with uh, food science and agricultural science, to be able to use remote sensing, um, we've, we, for, for many years, we have a whole department at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency that keeps track of food security and agricultural security for, for countries that might um, destabilize, where without the right sort of food resources available and the right agri national agricultural programs available, they might be a risk to their neighbors, they might be a risk um, for collapse, they might be a risk to our allies. So all of these, all of these sciences come together and the use of artificial intelligence kind of, kind of uh, enables it all together so that we can provide, again, the best warning, the best uh, information to our policymakers. Jason or Shen Yang? Do you want to comment on this question? Well, I think I can, I can add that regardless of what application domains, right, you do need this vibrant AI education and research and talents in that region, right? So then you can always take these talents, combine it with different domains of expertise in these different areas. Yeah, I think you get a lot of lift just from having the expertise in, in, you know, in a location. You know, we saw that with a lot of the genomics work that was done at WashU. Those people really moved around St. Louis into different areas. Um, you know, I think we're going to see that with geospatial. You know, I think that sort of talent mixing into various application areas just is very organic. I think I like the word organic because if you try to over organize it, it's overwhelming. Any other questions? Yes, please. Hi, um, I'm also a lifelong St. Louisan, proud St. Louisan, and we have an office and headquarters in downtown West. I feel like you guys are, work for three companies that are doing like world class, you know, national work. Um, and a lot of companies in St. Louis are, but we kind of get very insular in ourselves and we just kind of stick to our own communities that like Midwest humility, like you said, it's not a good thing, right? These are not secrets that should be being kept. So how can other companies in St. Louis talk about themselves or um, kind of engage with the community in a way that there, it's a story that's bigger than St. Louis to bring in national talent for your companies and everyone else that's here? That sounds like a good question for Greater St. Louis. If anyone wants to, where's Tracy? Brian, somebody, did you hear the question? How do we get the other companies in St. Louis to come to South by Southwest? <laughs> so quick, quick test for the audience. Let's, let's just name some of the top companies in St. Louis. You might. You might not realize, I, I'm, I'm looking at a lot of St. Louis people here. Boeing, right? Centene, Anheuser-Busch, Bear, Square, Square. Clementines! 
Do, when do we put a plug in for Clementine? Ice right cream, now? Ice cream. Ice <laughs> cream. All right, we, we're having ice cream from Clementine's afterwards. That's why I'm here, baby. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, let's, let's bring them down to, let's, you know, make believe they're doing artificial intelligence and bring them down to South by Southwest. So I, I tell you, I love this question because I think uh, it's, it shouldn't be forced. And I think what everybody's trying to do is let the good work speak for itself and if you notice nobody can do food security alone so they have to collaborate with everybody so we're picking the tough problems on this earth and this is to me it's over time it will bring everybody will start to talk about this because it's happening in this region um, but we shouldn't be too humble well, it's certainly true in AI for healthcare, we are collaborating all over the country, right? We have joint projects with Stanford, joint projects with you know, schools at the East Coast, and certainly it's a very collaborative culture. In healthcare in particular, you want multi-center studies because you have to make sure the AI works not only in St. Louis, but also in Boston, and also in Palo Alto, and so on, right? So. Any other questions before the final question? Yes. Hi, so I work for St. Louis University and I'm wondering how do we engage college students to use AI to solve pressing problems? Can you repeat please? How do we use our current group of college students to use AI to solve pressing problems? How do we use the current college students to solve the problems? Well, yeah, yes, yeah, we were already using them, right? So my, certainly our institute has armies of undergrads, right, from computer science, from data science. They're already contributing to all these research that we are doing. So for example, right, this Fitbit-based studies that we have done in many different domains, right, in the past decade or so, the initial data collection infrastructure was written by undergrad students at WashU, right? So I think they will be surprised to know that 10 years later, their code is still being used in all these major studies across different medical centers and different healthcare domains. I, I would say it's, uh, there's two different angles here. W one is sort of applying the a AI technology that's been developed over the last few years to a vast amount of business domains, right? So right now, AI is only being applied to you know, some, some domains that have promise. Um, so more and more of that, the expansion of applying AI to, all, to everything is going to happen over the next five or ten years. And that's a great opportunity, not just for computer science students or data science students, but for business students and, and, and everyone. And, and then, of course, then the other piece here is I think there's a whole class of artificial intelligence that we don't know about yet, right, that research are, researchers are sort of inventing now. And I, I, I am sure that we have students at St. Louis, St. Louis University, the other universities, that will be part of that research and that will invent things that we have not seen yet. So we have uh, three minutes left. So I say, uh, since we have you on the stage, how we're going to commit in front of this audience that will hold us accountable to solving some global challenges out of St. Louis. I will start what I want, and we need all the help that we can get. I want to get over flooding and wildfires and hurricanes killing people. We're in the 2024 and we still have people dying from what I call simple stuff, flooding and fires. So I'm using everything that I have to solve these problems, to mitigate them, to predict them, and to save those lives. Mark? Yeah, I would say it, it aligns with the core values of my agency. Um, we want to shine light on people that are doing things that they shouldn't be doing to prevent them from doing it. Yes, Jason? Well, it's kind of where I started. I mean, what I'm focused on is really a recommoditization of soybean, coming out with a, a soybean that's materially better 
for its end use applications in, in feed and food. And I think that has tremendous value for really all of us. Yeah, I'll say our healthcare system today is far from optimal, right? So, um, so my, my, what I'm busy with is to work with many others to um, seamlessly integrate trustworthy AI into our healthcare systems so that AI and physicians and clinicians can work together to make our healthcare more cost effective and more targeted to result in better human health and outcomes. All right, so we got better health, better public health, better human health, soybean of the future. All right, you heard it here first. And then just preventing bad people from doing bad things with <laughs> and saving the world. Are you in? Are you in? Yes? All right. Well, thank you so much, Shenyang, Jason, and Mark, and big, big thanks to Greater St. Louis Inc., Tracy and her team, for actually getting us together and for the Midwest, uh, you know, this amazing tent in the shade with these amazing people who will be having ice cream very soon, right? All right. Thank you so much. Thanks.